Okay, so this is lecture 32 of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do today in this lecture is we're going to switch gears, multi-carrier modulation, to the other data transmission scheme that was like promoted very heavily in the late 1990s and early 2000s. It was released in 3GPP and other cellular standards. And it was supposed to be the be-all that ends all in terms of transmission format. Um, but there's, as you'll see, there are some real significant challenges with this technology. Every technology has its challenges. This one is no different. So it's called spread spectrum communications. Okay? And so what we saw, what we saw in the last lecture, or last several lectures with respect to multi-carrier modulation, is that information is arranged in time and in frequency. What spread spectrum communication does is it does a little trick. There's a little trick, okay? So I'm, I'm just going to cut to the chase because I, I just, I'm so impatient. So the way spread spectrum communication works is like this. Oh, come on. What happens is you have your signal. And this is one type of spread spectrum. So let's say that's frequency. That's your original signal. And then what happens is you pass it through a spreader. And I'll explain the architecture for a spreader soon. So let's say you spread this signal. What ends up happening is the energy of the signal is conserved, but the bandwidth and the height of the signal changes, right? And then, so this happens at the transmitter. At the receiver, the exact opposite. What happens is you have your spreaded signal. So that's in frequency, that's in frequency. You despread. And then you get the original back. And you might wonder, and this is one particular type of spread spectrum. It's called direct sequence spread spectrum. There's another one called frequency hopping spread spectrum. Um, and you might wonder, What's involved in the spreader and despreader that gets these signals from the original frequency representation to some sort of sp really far out, wide, very low PSD looking signal, and then back to the original? And the answer is there's something called um, um, uh, uh, there's a, a something called the spreading code, okay, uh, which we'll look at in in a few minutes. So what happens is the, what we're doing with spread spectrum communications, unlike OFDM and multi-carrier modulation, is that what we do is we give every signal or every user um, a unique spreading sequence or spreading code. Right? Um, it's based off of something called a pseudo-random noise or PN sequence. And what this thing does is the longer, let's say if you have 126 or 128-bit spreading sequence, that's a very long spreading sequence. It will uniquely identify a user to a base station. And then let's say I give unique spreading sequences to everyone in this room. What happens is you have this unique key that takes your information, spreads it across frequency. So very low power, very wide band. Send it over a channel. So whoever's listening for you will have the matching spreading code and reverses your spreading. What's also very interesting is unless that individual has the exact spreading sequence, they will not be able to recover your signal. So it's great. OK, yes? So earlier, like in the last lesson, you mentioned that spreading is kind of competing with multi-carrier. Yes. But you can spread multi-carrier. OK, so the question is, in the last lecture, I mentioned about how spreading competed with multi-carrier. And now I'm saying about how, like, well, now there are techniques where you have multi-carrier and spreading. And the answer is yes. And so this is really jumping ahead a lot, but I'm going to answer it because I'm just impatient. So what happens is up until 2001, um, you know, everybody looked at spread spectrum communications and 3G communications and all cellular communications as a be all that ends all. Initially in the 1980s, Spreading, spread spectrum communication, militaries love them. 
Why? Very low power makes it very difficult to detect. And if you have a PN sequence that scrambles up the information, your enemy cannot decode what it is, right? And so then someone says, what happens if I have a cellular network and everybody has their own spreading sequence? Oh, and what's also beautiful is anyone in signal that's in there with my own signal, it would remain spreaded, but my signal would be unspreaded, so it would magically come out of the noise floor, right? So it sounds like it's like the sort of the, a great solution for a cellular network, right? It's like immune to narrowband interference. Um, it's, it, you can coexist with tons of other cellular cell, cell phone users, and if they each have their own unique spreading code, I can extract information, and everybody says, this is the future. Multi-carry modulation, ha, 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 ha. That's in DSL modems. That's in cable modems. Oh, there's this Wi-Fi thing. Oh, maybe that, blah, blah, blah. 2001 comes along. All the hype behind 3G and spread spectrum communication was a lot of hype and wasn't delivering. And then tech bubble bursted in 2001. If you had mutual funds at that time, it didn't go so well. And then people said, and 3GPP and 3GPP2 over precision, like, like, you know, documents filling whole rooms. And then people just said, what are we doing? So it's, it's sputtered, right? Then people said, look at Wi-Fi. And then the European equivalent, the Etsy equivalent, Hyperlan, Hyperlan 2. And then it's like, wow, I'm getting good performance. Like, you started with 802.11. It was nothing. It was just single carrier. It, was, it used CCK modulation, which is spread spectrum-like. That's the requirement for 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. And it supported up to 1 megabit per second traffic. Woo! Then came 802.11b. B before A? Hmm. What happens is 802.11b came along. 11 megabits per second. And it, more of this CCK modulation and stuff. And then 802.11a was deployed at 5 gigahertz. Mm, didn't do so well. People don't like going into 5, right? But it was, um, what was it? A was 56 megabits per second, and it was OFDM. Then they began intersecting. I can't use OFDM by itself in 2.4 to 2.5 um, gigahertz. So what I need to do is I need to spread it. So what happens is 802.11g is multi-carrier, but with CCK modulation to spread the, the signal to make it conform to the FCC regulations in 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. At the same time, one of the big issues, there are several huge issues with spread spectrum communications, which we'll look at, but I'm, I, I don't like surprises. I'm just going to tell you guys, so the rest of the time you can relax. But what happens is the spreading code. What makes the spreading code so powerful is it, it runs at something called the chip rate, which is a fraction of your symbol rate. And you might say, so what? What happens if you have a lot of data at a very narrow symbol rate, and then your chip rate is one one thousandth of that. Synchronization becomes humongous, and it's yet another issue. So then people came along, and I think I talked about this during office hours today, about there are several variants of combining spread spectrum with multi-carrier. There's multi-code CDMA and multi-carrier CDMA. I forgot which one's which, but one spreads the subcarriers and then adds them together, and one combines the subcarriers together and then spreads them. I think people are just trying to be unique. And you might see that in some modulation schemes nowadays, but what happens is there are just too many difficulties with respect to um, like recovering for very, very high data rates, the chip sequence and everything. On the other hand, it's still great for like, you know, low probability of interception, low probability of detection, and all that sort of jazz. But the one thing people didn't realize is if you have 200 users using spread spectrum communications, you're raising the interference and noise floor. So you actually have a huge performance degradation at the end. So capacity ain't so great. The other thing is there's another type of spread spectrum communications, frequency hopping. And what standard uses that? Bluetooth. So how many people here use Bluetooth? In my car, right? And what happens is depend if you're in France, that they use a different bandwidth. But in North America and elsewhere, I think you have like, uh, I forgot, 74, 76 hops in France because of a smaller bandwidth that's fewer. And what happens is it also has the beauty of low probability of interception and detection and all that. And if you jam it at one hop, it still has 75 other hops to transmit the data across. So it's quite nice. 
So that, that in a nutshell answers the question. So what happens is 2001 was where people who bet on spread spectrum communications kind of lost money, literally. It was also 2001 is when everybody that got laid off. So in Canada, you know, the Nortel story, what happened was, uh, you know, there were layoffs 10 to 20,000 at a time. Hmm, I think I need to go back into grad school. Then you saw the surge of graduate students going back. It was awful. It was like, when I went in 2000, everybody thought I was an idiot. It's like, Jesus, Alex. Like, you know, you could, like, go into a company, rake in tons of money. You can invest in mutual funds. Everything's all set, you know? Everyone's hiring electrical engineers. We're not producing enough electrical engineers in this country. Blah, 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 blah. 2001, the layoffs began happening, right? And what happened was... Then everybody came in, oh, I would love to do grad school, PhD studies, can you tell me more and stuff? And I was already there, you know, one year. And, and, and by then, I picked OFDM and multi-carrier modulation, adaptive modulation. So I, I made the right bet. My master's thesis at Queen's University was on, uh, what is it? Mutual coupling effects in smart antenna arrays for CDMA cellular communications. Dodge the bullet there. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing. Oh, um, uh, so this is a bit of an aside. So in 2004, I was pretty much done with my PhD. I defended in October of 2004. And then I started going on the job market. And, you know, I think on average in North America every year, Canada and the U.S., there's about 90 faculty positions per year that are advertised, right? And I listened to my, the younger of my two PhD advisors. So he went on to the job market in 1999, 2000, and he came from Belgium to North America, to, to McGill. McGill's like pretty good. And he interviewed, he I think he applied to 12, he got interviewed at six, he had four job offers, he went with McGill. And the reason is it was a French speaking, you know, uh, you know he, from Belgium there, it was, it was a good transition. And then I, and he said, oh, don't worry about it, just submit 12 applications, that's more than enough. So cautious me, I applied to like 96 uh, places across North America. And I only got nibbles for one interview that was a tenure-track position. I'm not going to mention which university, but it was in a far and cold place. And it was small, but it was, it's a nice university, but very far away from civilization. I'm not, I'm not going to say which one, because I'm being recorded. And, and, and what happened is University of Kansas says, by the way, you might be interested in this research position as well. Hint. You're not being considered for a tenure track position, you better take it. And, and I'm glad I did because I learned about a lot of things. What happens is one of the universities, the admin assistant, because you know there's a privacy thing, right? The admin assistant, she kind of messed up. So, you know, rejection emails and rejection letters, I had like, I threw them all away, but I had like easily 200 rejection letters. And almost like universities love sending rejection letters. It's like, ha ha, you didn't get the job. The rejection emails, I don't think I kept any either. I should have kept this one because this one, the uh, admin assistant CC'd all 450 rejected applicants rather than BCC'd them. So I got to see 450 of my competition. And it was frightening because what happens is the deluge of PhD applicants to the PhD program in 2001, the really solid, like, take no prisoner type PhD candidates were also finishing up at the same time. So I was competing with, and it was frightening because you just saw the list. MIT, 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 Stanford, MIT, University of Illinois, MIT, Maryland, Michigan, Michigan, MIT, Stanford. There were very few people from like tier two and below universities. There were only like five foreigners. I was one of them, right? So yeah, it was a very, so why, why did I bring that up is because the tech bubble changed the landscape of a lot of things, like including uh, wireless communications, because wireless communications now is not so much, um, I would say, like in, in the 1990s, it was a revolution and wireless access and how can we do better. We're now kind of entering sort of like maybe not so much, um, like we're not developing new modulation, we're definitely not inventing new modulation schemes, where it's more like it's interdisciplinary and it's very application specific. Right? So the way communications research, so all the papers you've read from the 1970s are very different than what they are now. Okay? So anyways, my little aside.
It's also being recorded, so you can watch this entire five-minute thing online afterwards. <laughs> okay. Hello, people. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. If I show my wife, she thinks I'm going to. Be, uh, she already knows I'm crazy. But okay. So that answers your question, Neil. Okay. Now I can stop talking and start talking about this. Mmm, muffin. Okay. <laughs> now. <laughs> so um, let's just cut to the chase. So multi-carrier modulation. I said divide and conquer, divide and conquer. And in the end, it seems like that was the solution. It still seems to be the solution that is being promoted now. In fact, have any of you heard of 5G communications? Yay! Yeah! And you wonder what 5G communications is going to contain. It's probably going to contain MIMO. LTE A already has some MIMO attributes. But now it's like Internet of Things. Uh, lots of, uh, of spectrum sensing and cognitive radio, uh, wideband stuff, um, MIMO, like, like on, uh, on a very large scale, on very compact devices, um, uh, multi-hop networking with MIMO. It's like basically take everything that you're looking at theoretically now and make it into a handset that's a cell phone. Oh, yeah, I got this. Like, you know, imagine some teenager saying, oh, yeah, mom. Uh, I want this latest cell phone. I think it's an iPhone 7S or something, and it has uh, multi-hop capability and MIMO SVD. And oh yeah, it has something called cognitive radio engine. It's really powerful. You know, imagine a teenager talking about this. We're talking about it at like you know, this is a graduate course, right? In twenty, in in five years, easily teenagers like what? You don't have a cognitive radio? <laughs> you know? Oh, I can imagine that, right? And then you say, yeah, I worked on it in 2014. Oh, my God. That, that will date you. Okay. So multi-carrier modulation. It's cool. You can tailor it to whatever channel conditions. Um, divide and conquer. Redistribute information across frequency and time. Wonderful stuff, especially for high data rates. Spect spectrum communications fly below the radar. Oh, yeah. This is your stealth mode modulation scheme. Um, UWB, ultra wideband, is the uber stealth mode, right? It's really wideband. So what makes it ultra wideband? When you have your carrier frequency on the same order uh, of like bandwidth as the overall bandwidth of your transmission. So we're talking about extremely narrow pulses. And what happens is that pulse, um, what, 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 what's one over T? Extremely wide, like you know maybe tens, hundreds, um, thousands of megahertz wide, right? Really, really wide transmissions. They don't travel far, but they have a ridiculous amount of information, right? Like, wouldn't it be cool if they had a radio technology? It's like, oh, um, hey, Bengi, uh, here's my movie, my DVD. Okay, there, did you get it? Oh, yeah, I got it. Thank you very much. You know, and there you go. <laughs> yeah, see, my, my impersonations are not really that good. Trust me, like, you know, whenever I try and impersonate my mom, and then I begin impersonating other people, they all sound like my mom, you know, which is not so good. So I'm not going to bring her up. Not yet. I'm on TV. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is um, ultra wideband is like, the, like the, the sort of the extreme case of flying below the radar. There's still some places where uh, 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 not allowed to transmit regardless how quiet you are. GPS. So GPS bands are one place you're absolutely not to transmit anything else because, you know, the, G the satellite signal is so weak, it's also underneath that noise and interference floor, and because of signal processing techniques, it, it's extracted out of it, right? So nothing else should be there, otherwise planes fall from the sky. Don't tell my wife that, she's afraid of flying. I'm a little bit afraid of flying. So what spread spectrum communication does is it really geared, and this is what made it attractive as a cellular technology, although uh, it, what happens is, it spreads your information over a very wide bandwidth at a very low power. So imagine then you can stack users on top. You increase the interference floor a little bit. No one really interferes with each other because at the receiver, he who has the right code will get the information correctly and everything else gets spread out. Beautiful. Ha <laughs> ha! So how do you do this cool, neat thing? Because what happens is, in addition to supporting multiple users, if you are a military of some nation, you might also want to prevent being jammed too, right? It's like, do you get this over? And you know, you're jamming, jamming, jamming. Aha, but I'm immune to jamming. Hee! And you just keep on transmitting, right? So what happens is, this is how you do spread spectrum. 
And so you have your channel encoding, so you protect your information, you modulate it, and the modulator, what it does is it uses something, I mentioned this before, pseudo-random noise sequence, PN sequence, right? And there are a variety of ways of making that PN sequence. You then send that modulated data with the, uh, that's been spreaded, and I'll explain how mathematically this is accomplished. It's sent over the channel, you have the exact same pseudo-random sequence, you multiply it against um, those bits uh, like at the exact same instance, so you effectively unspread. And I'll explain what I mean in a minute. You decode, you get your data. So how, how does this work? Well, first of all, I mentioned that in order to properly decode the message, you must have the exact same PN sequence as your transmitter. Otherwise, it, it ain't going to fly. And then secondly, uh, you got to be really, and this is the problem with a lot of spread spectrum systems, you better be synchronized. If you don't lock on to the right chip rate and at the right point or the right hopping sequence, if you're out of phase, if you're out of sync, your system is as good as useless, right? Hey! Multi-carrier. So what happens is there are going to be two types of spread spectrum that we'll be looking at, DSSS and FHSS. Direct sequence spread spectrum and frequency hopping spread spectrum. So let's look at DSS because it's first. So what happens is the DSSS randomizes the information by scrambling the time domain waveform using a pseudo random sequence. Okay, so I think I'm just going to cut to the chase because I have a diagram several slides from now, but I'm impatient. It's my class, and I can do whatever I want. No, just kidding. <laughs> no. Because this is a learning experience. Seriously. Because what happens is you might say, what do you mean? Chip sequence, PN sequence, spreading. What do you mean? OK, so here's the thing. Remember I showed that diagram? Here's my spectrum. Has this bandwidth, right? And then I spread it through some magical box. And then I get something that looks like this, right? So energy-wise, it's the same. It's conserved, but it's spread over wide bandwidth, lower in power density, right? Now, you might wonder, how do you accomplish that? So the way you do this is the following. Let's say you take your time domain waveform. Let's say we take something like this. Sound effects included. And what happens is you have 0, T, 2, T, 3, T. What's the bandwidth? <coughs> so it's 1 over T, right? Minus 1 over T. Correct? Everyone, everyone cool? Yeah? Now, what happens <laughs> if I take this time domain waveform and modulate it so that's time. That's time. Here's 0. Here's t. Here's 2t. Here's 3t. And I modulate it with, multiply it with this. And I'm, I'm not going to draw all the ups and downs because I think I'm going to go crazy. Too late. So let's say I multiply by that. What do I get? So let's say we take this. What you're going to get is something that looks like this. So what happens is what's 1? So let's say that's a plus 1. That's a minus 1. That's a plus 1. That's a minus 1. What's 1, ti what's one times 1? One? 1. And then what's 1 times minus 1? So what happens is you almost have like this superposition and then, oh, now I have minus 1 times 1. Let me get rid of that. <sighs> See, I have to be careful with my eraser. <laughs> so what happens is I now have, let's say at that point, what happens is, oh, 1 times minus 1 is this. And so everything's inverted, in fact. And then it inverts again. 
and so on and so forth. But what's interesting about here? What's the bandwidth of the signal? The bandwidth is now the width. Essentially, it's like the, the width, the duration of whatever your chip is. So each one of these guys is referred to as a chip. And we call it a chip rate, like how many chips do we have per second. And so what this translates, like if you notice, this is about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's 6 chips per symbol. So how, what is going to be the new bandwidth? It's going to be 6 times as wide, 6 times as short, right? So what you get is now, you get essentially here, 1 over, no, 6 over t. And then whatever amplitude is here, A, or power level and stuff, that's going to be 1 sixth of that. So power is conserved. And so that is how you spread. That's how you do DSSS. Now, what's very interesting? What happens if I take this sequence and multiply it by itself? I square it. Uno, and I don't mean the restaurant. Uno as in 1 as an amplitude. Why? What's 1 times 1? One? 1. What's minus 1 times minus 1? One? 1. What's minus 1 times 1? It doesn't matter. That will never happen. If I properly align these guys, I have no problem in terms of, of converting. And so, so that's why, like, that's my PN sequence. Let's say I have whatever length of chips that uniquely defines me. What ends up happening is essentially when I do this multiplication with any waveform, I spread its energy out, and then if I have the matching key at the receiver and I multiply it, I, I do multiplication of the thing against itself, has to be perfectly synchronized. I mean, down to the chip, I get the original signal back. Right? 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 What happens if I use a different chip sequence? <gasps> then I don't perfectly get the sequence back, right? It's PN sequence with a mismatched or non-corresponding PN sequence. I will not be able to get perfectly one recovered when combining the two PN sequences. This is what I mean that, let's say Matt over there has one PN sequence. I have another. Travis has another. Uh, Peng Fei has another. We each have our own PN sequence. And as long as they're sufficiently different, only we will get signals that the belong to us, we will be the only ones to be able to decode it. Everyone else is just going to get garbage. <sighs> now, so OK. So that's why I needed to draw this. Because, so now we're talking about the details of direct sequence spread spectrum. So what we do, that process of multiplying chip sequence, PN sequence, whatever you want to call it, with your waveform is called spreading. And so we have some terms. So the first thing is we have the chip period, TC. We have TB, which is the bit period, right? So that's our bit rate. Let's say we're doing, we're just, we're taking just raw bits. We're not actually doing symbols even. We're just spreading the bits. And what happens is the chip is one bit of a binary information that's a fraction of the size of the information bit. So, so what I mean is just like what I've shown. You know, I showed 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. And then the chip should be a tiny fraction of that. And it turns out that LC, the number of chips that constitute one bit, multiplied by the chip period, gives you one bit period. Ooh, OK. So now, given that, our chip rate, we can define it as LC, the number of chips divided by the bit period. And so, I mentioned synchronization as a very serious issue, right? And interference floor is another serious issue, right? Hardware is another issue. So if you're talking about really serious chip rates, you're going to need really serious analog, digital, digital, analog converters. And that is expensive, right? Practical, right? Uh-uh. Because who here will buy a cell phone for $500? 
I'm just making sure my arms are crossed because I'm not going to raise my hand. Right? Who here wants to buy a cell phone for free? All right? Oh, wait. So everyone else wants to buy a cell phone if you get money back, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, so you fooled me. What happens is, the, the thing is, the analog digital digital analog converter, that's a lot of money, right? That's, that's a big chunk of the hardware costs, right? And so what happens is that's one of the things. Like, if you're going to have thousands of chips, you better be able to sample and resolve those chips at the receiver. So this diagram here, this schematic, is a nicer way of showing if you've got your bit information, you have your chip sequence. Notice here it's not just up, down, up, down, up, down. I actually took great care to make it look unique. And each one of you can get a unique pseudo-random noise sequence, right? And so let's say you have the same information and Bengi and Anne and Alexi and Re. Each one of you have your own PN sequence. You might have the same information, but you won't be able to decode each other's unless you have the identical PN sequence. <sighs> and so what, at the end of the day, what you get is a sequence. It has that wide bandwidth. It's and you can it sounds like security. is at the receiver, you take this guy, you get the match. Lo and behold, if you do everything right and you pay the big bucks to get that cool cell phone that can do the A to D conversion, get that PN sequence, boom, you get the original sequence back. Right? Spectral, just mentioned, you, like, like, if you have LC chips per bit, what you'll see is that your spreaded signal will have Spreaded by bandwidth of LC, and it will be reduced in power spectral density by LC. The overall power is the same. This process does not do anything to the overall power of the signal. It just rearranges it spectrally, right? So it's different. It's the same in different, like, multi-carrier. Multi-carrier rearranges information across frequency. So does spread spectrum, but in a very different way. Instead of putting it into silos, it says, I'm going to smear that information across a very wide band and can only be recovered in the code space using the right PN sequence. Oh. So, remember, energy is always a constant. So now let's look a little bit about the math. So now this, so the thing is, I, I have to admit the notes here very heavily summarize what is in your course textbook. Because your course textbook goes through a lot of, like, I would say, like, really gory detail math, right? So intuitively, what does this all mean? So if you want to get a good insight, a lot of these notes, I actually, because spread spectrum, OFDM, and all these are a little bit more advanced topics, so you might not find them in the regular digital comms textbook. Um, Proakis's and Salehi's other book, Communication Systems Engineering, is actually quite nice. That's where, so they have a nice section on OFDM, a little bit more graphic, maybe too, too graphical for my liking, but it's, I find that our course textbook, the digital comms one, is on, on the terse side a little bit. So there's a little bit of a trade-off. So if you're looking for conceptual comm systems engineering, if you're looking for the math and the gritty, digital comms. So this same thing, the, spec, the spread spectrum representation, this was um, sort of integrated into these slides from that book, but keeping in mind the notation that you have in your course textbook, right? And so the operation that the PN sequence is pulling off is an exclusive OR. You have A, you have BI, and you have CI. And so these are your PN se sequences and your, and your, and your information, um, the channel encoded information. And what you're doing is you're saying, uh, are the two the same? Are the two different? Um, and then you encode accordingly. Right? So the way this works is as follows. So you take the A, you map it, like, let's say you take this like A sequence, and so what we have here, what happens is we have essentially, um, you know, uh, th th this, this signal here. So we have S of T, and it's plus or minus the real. So we're, we're taking, we're essentially doing an exponential modulation. So we're taking E to the J, 2 pi F C of T, and we're modulating against this G I of T signal. So we're basically modulating to some carrier frequency, FC, and then we're taking the real of that, right? So it's like some sort of passband signaling, 
correct? Then you might ask, what is G? What happens is G I of T is some sort of time delayed version. So depending on which chip we're dealing with, right, the ith chip, or what we're doing is we're taking this waveform, we're time shifting it, it's only TC wide, and what AI is doing is, is it zero? Is it? Is it? If it is, negative, we, we take the negative of that waveform. So we have the exact same pulse shape, same waveform. If it's a zero, it's a negative version, and it's TC wide, and if it is, oh, sorry, other way around. So zero, it's positive, and one, it's negative. Okay? So essentially what G of T is, is the pulse shape. And G I of T, what it represents is the pulse, the pulse at the ith chip, right? And it's either plus or minus the, the fundamental pulse. Ith of T should be the summation of... Yeah, you're right. So it's, there should be a summation of that. You're right. That's a good point. So, so basically, S of T should be the sum of that. And so, yeah, otherwise, one chip is very interesting. <laughs> it's almost like regular potato chips. You can't stop at one. So you're right. So um, S of T should be the sum of these real passband representations. Excellent. So let's, let's dig in a little deeper. <clears throat> So what happens is we have this, um, an, we can represent this another way. So we can have CI, okay, and we can basically, t the CI of T, and what CI of T does essentially is you take that basic waveform at the ith chip, and again, you do the plus or minus one modulation based on what that CI is. So that's another nice way of doing this. And then your output waveform P I of T, essentially again, is the plus or minus one, and you have this basic pulse shape P T minus I C T. So again, the I chip. So we have these two waveforms, G of T and P of T, and we're either making them negative or positive values based on what these bits, these chips are telling me to do, right? So as a result, when I combine um, P I of T and C I of T, I get G I of T, and what I'm hoping for is if the two correspond with each other, they make one, right? And we can recover the signal. And so that's what we have in this, this block here. So th this is the low pass signaling for, for all that. We're not dealing with any passband modulation and such. So you might ask, where does this come in? Where the, like, there are actually three representations for D. So spread spectrum communications, the DSSS, this is a DS QPSK modulator, direct sequence QPSK modulation. So what you have is you have two PN sequences, right, that are being generated. What happens is I'm doing, I'm taking those guys, I'm taking the encoded data, and what I'm doing is I'm doing the I and the Q separately. So I'm spreading the in-phase data, and I'm spreading the quadrature data using the PN sequences, right? That's why I have an in-phase and quadrature branch. I have a local oscillator. That's what low means, local oscillator, right? So I have cosine and sine modulation. I do my modulo 2 adder, right? And then I sum them together and send them on their way, right? Now, at the receiver... When I try to despread, I have one of three possible options. We're going to be looking at one of them in the next lecture. Okay? So you can either use a match filter re realization, right? And then what you do is once you have that match filter, um, you start sampling. And then once you sample, you have what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to calculate what the chip rate is so you try and get in sync with things. And then you start despreading. You, you use the, again, you use your PN sequence generator, you're multiplying against, the, you know, with the match filtering, so it's SNR maximizing, you then try and find where the chips are happening, and then you now begin combining the two, 
in order to recover the data. You're trying to unspread it. Yes? So at the spread, you had 15 sequences, right? Yeah. Or so this would be a... So the, the, I, I see where you're getting at. So the, the question is, we have two PN sequences at the transmitter. This would be for like one branch, of course. So, the, the, so, so what you would do for, like, you know, you have I and Q, is you would have to, like, first of all... Um, yeah, so, so, what, so what was left out here is you would need to, just eyeballing it, even before, like with the R of T, is you would need to split it up into cosine modulated, bring to baseband, low pass filter, the double frequency terms, and then work on it individually on the I and one on the Q. So excellent point. Thank you. And then the same thing for B and C. So, so you would do this for each branch, I and Q. So this is one approach, match filter. The other approach is go straight to PN sequence and the spreading. And then what you do is you multiply by G star of T, right? So you're kind of doing a core. What you're doing is essentially you're doing a correlation-based approach, right? So what happens is I want to correlate against the G of T waveform. I want to match these guys, right? And find out how much do they correlate here. So what I do is I first unspread as best I can. And then what happens is I multiply by the complex conjugate of G of T. I then integrate across the chip period. And then I sample. And then from that, what happens is, um, as you see, there's also a chip rate clock that's also trying to figure out, like, you know, where should I be despreading using this PN sequence, right? Uh, yep. I have a question. After you unspread, mm -hmm. then you should match, like, you should correlate with the. Uh, with the desired pulse shape, right? Because what happens is... So the question is, once you despread, you want to correlate, and the answer is yes. But with the desired, uh, you know, desired, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find where should I be, like where does my waveform actually begin? Here, here, here. And so what the correlation does is you're looking for that peak to say, aha, that, that's where I should be. I'm now looking at this, I'm wondering if it should be TB, not TC, because it could be anywhere within the, yeah, yeah, so, so it should be a TB. Ah, so people are not watching these videos and just look at the notes. <laughs> no, so that should be, you're right, it should be a TB, otherwise it makes no sense, it's like, okay. Because you're already on this present, so. Yeah, good point, good point. So what happens is this, this we're using, and then from that where we do is we then sample at the desired instant. Excellent, thank you. Last but not least, and I'm wondering, let me see if this also should be TB. I'm, I must have been asleep while doing these slides. So here, this should be, uh, let's see. Like ah, uh, yes. Yeah, because you're only doing spreading at the end. You're right. Okay, so in this case, you take the waveform, you're doing the correlation to find out where the chip is. So, so right now, you do, with the help of the chip rate clock, then you sample, then you despread, and then you get the answer. Okay. So that the second guy must have been just a typo. It should be TB. Okay. So yes, Neil. So what's the best way to handle like interference? So let's say like you spread your spectrum, but there's like something in it. Mm -hmm. So do you just like when you despread, you just carry that with you, or do you kind of like null it and then despread? Like I'm kind of curious, what's the like, unspread? Yeah, or if there's like if there's like some spurs in your in your spreaded spectrum, do you like want to take those out, or do you just want to like unspread? And so the question is, what happens if I have a narrowband interferer? And that's actually um, lecture 33. But I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, because that's what I love doing best. So what happens is, suppose you have your spreaded signal, then you have your narrowband interferer, right? What happens is, if I take this guy, and I start despreading, okay? What happens is um, the PN sequence is applied to everything in that band. So what's going to happen is the desired signal is going to be recovered, right? It's linear. And then that other guy that's superimposed gets spreaded. So that guy does this. So it contributes to the overall interference and noise floor. But it will not be the jammer, it will not cause a disaster. And then what happens is, oh, I think I'm going to filter everyone out. 
So what happens is at the end of the day, um, you only get a fraction of the energy of the jammer that's actually present in influencing your signal to noise ratio. So that's what happens to narrow band jammers. Wide band jammers, which is kind of ridiculous because you need a lot of power and stuff, um, those, like if you have wide band jammer and you spread it, um, it's uh, across the band, it's, it doesn't work, right? So how does that compare if you were to just like null that section of your spread spectrum? Yeah, but why? Oh, so the question is why not just null that out? And the answer is why do I need that additional hardware? Right? Especially if it's a cell phone that I'm trying to sell on cents on the dollar. Like, and I have to put like a notch filter or something. Well, that's an analog component, isn't it? And so doesn't that increase in costs and stuff like that? And if I want the digital realization, I have to sense where the jammer is and stuff. So complexity is like, I got a PN sequence, and then I filter. Boop. You know, so, so it's sometimes keeping it simple is, is the best approach. But if we had like $10,000 software-defined radios and stuff at our disposal, oh, yeah, I would design a comb filter instantly and null that, that guy, in addition to doing cool stuff with the despreading and stuff. But good question. Okay. So that concludes lecture. Uh, that concludes lecture thirty-two. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to jump into lecture thirty-three. This one's a little bit more mathematical, 